Hello, I'm Dr. Jim Myers, Director of Stewardship for the Diocese of Charleston. Welcome to Conversations in Stewardship. Our guests today are Barbara and Dutch Schultz from the Diocese of St. Augustine in Florida. Welcome to Charleston. Thank you. Our pleasure to be here. Dutch, I wonder if you'd uh, just uh, to begin to sort of set a, a foundation for us, talk, talk a little bit about what is sacrificial giving? Sacrificial giving is really, that's one way of forming stewardship. It's based on four principles. And the first and most important one is that we put God first in our lives in everything, including our time, our talent, and our treasure. And that's the number one. Then number two, we, we promote the idea of using an envelope so that people make a, a conscious decision about what, what they're going to give each weekend to the parish. And then third, we ask the people to use the, the tithe as a guide. It's, uh, and I say that, you know, we, when we give our presentation, we say, if you're not giving anything, you might give something. If you're at 1%, you might go to 1.5% or 2%. In other, words, in other words, take a step in faith to be more generous, realizing that God will never be outdone in generosity. And then the, the fourth principle is that your gift should be a sacrifice. It should affect our lifestyle somehow. So that's, that's, those are the four principles of sacrificial giving. And the, what, what we found now in working with parishes and doing this personally for, now for, for about 40 years is that you, you, when you do that and you think of giving first to the church and the poor, you always have enough left for yourself. And you never think about getting more for yourself because the more you get, the more you got to share. So it's a whole different mindset than what we've been brought up with in our culture. So really you can uh, personally uh, experience benefits of oh, sacrificial absolutely. giving. The, the other thing that you, that you benefit is a wonderful peacefulness and you never worry about money. It's, it's just one of those things. Barbara's been the worry about money. She takes care of the books. I don't <laughs> worry about it at all. There's just nothing. I'm, I've always worked in the church for less than I could get in the public sector, but never affected my giving. And we've always been on the tithing. We've always saved money, too. So and we've been very generous to our kids. So it's just, it's been a, a marvelous way to live. It's, Barbara, I know that you've been involved in sacrificial giving for a very long time. Would you tell us how you began? In the beginning, you know, we were, um, it was 1961 when began, we began to tithe, and I, Dutch came home and said to me that he wanted to start with the next paycheck. And I thought he was crazy, because I thought, this isn't, this isn't for us, this is for everybody else. I mean, we are... We were already making a contribution to our parish. We had, we, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. We were giving $1 a Sunday. No, $2 a Sunday, I think. And um, Dutch said, no. He said, you know, I know what we're not getting what a public school teacher would get, but we're, we've got what we've got, and, and we have to share from there. So I, I, I didn't. I couldn't understand trusting in the Lord then. And I, I was very sarcastic, and I said to Dutch, all right, you trust in the Lord, and I'll depend on you, and we'll do this for one year. And so um, we did. But I, I had to pray. I really had to pray hard, and I'm, I write the checks. And it took me about 10 years before I could stop thinking to myself when I wrote out those checks, oh, what I could buy with this if I didn't have to give this away. But that, you know, that's sort of like, that wasn't really giving it. It's like giving it away and then keeping a string on it. So I had to pray about that. And I, I asked the Lord to take that away so that I could really give and um, be free of it. That, that was hard for me. Dutch, one of the things I, <clears throat> that uh, we want to receive your wisdom on is the, the question of how do you help a parish to start this journey? I know this is really one of the things that you've been doing all these years is going around and helping parishes get started. What's, what's the, what are the steps that you go through? Well, there are several things. In our experience now, doing, working with parishes as volunteers for 20 years, the number one uh, measure of success of any parish will be the commitment of the pastor uh, to the principal, even if he doesn't practice it himself, if he's willing to say, I'm moving in that direction myself, 
he's willing to say that and, and to say that to the people, that's number one. Number two is lay witness. That's having people like, like you're hearing Barbara talk about her experience with it. Everybody has a story. That's number two. And then good materials. And I think that underneath it all, and probably the underpinning for all of stewardship, it requires a conversion, a turning towards yeah. God. And so uh, what we found is the, the people who are respond to this message, first off, at the first hearing, are people who have been involved with Renew, small groups of some kind, uh, Christ Renews encounter. His Parish, Marriage Encounter, Charismatic Renewal, Curseal, those kinds of things. Because those people have had an experience of a relationship with the Lord. And so, if you, you know, until we get that going, that's going to be the, the key issue to really make this prosper, is having ways, you know, and having uh, missions and retreats, it's getting people closer to the Lord. And out of our, our very commercial culture, I think it's all part of our tradition that we got to be have to be careful not to be trapped by material goods. Instead, we have to be thinking in terms of serving the poor and and trying to, to support our church so we can minister to the poor. So it's kind of a, it's really a peer ministry where lay people talking to lay people. The pastor cannot do this by himself. He can preach till the cows come home and he'll, he'll never get this message. It's going to have to be through the, through the life blood of the parish, through the living of the parish. And the other thing about that, parishes who are successful are parishes who have a ministry, a mission, I should say, beyond themselves. People who are not just turned in on themselves to build more and more buildings or whatever, but thinking of the third world, inner city parishes, that kind of thing, willing to becoming tithing parishes. What sort of message will you leave with the people that you're going to speak to here in South Carolina? You meet with them, and what do they do next? How do they proceed? And we just say, don't start this. Do not begin with this unless you're willing to renew it at least once a year. Mm -hmm. This is not a program. This is a process. And it takes, it's kind of a soaking process. We've had people, you know, like couples we've met <clears throat> that have heard this message for seven years before they finally made, the, made that commitment to change. So it, it takes a while for people to get this, especially in our culture. So uh, that's one of the first things. Renewal every year. Stewardship committee needs somebody <clears throat> to, to uh, um, nurture, it. nurture it. People are committed to it themselves who want other people to share this way of life. We have a wonderful theological statement by the bishops, the U.S. Yeah. bishops pastoral called the heart of the, the stewardship yeah. of disciples response. And uh, so that's another document that is so beautifully written and so easy to understand. We recommend every parish, all the parish leadership, take a chapter at each of their meetings once a month or whatever and just review these questions at the end of the chapter to get a feeling for this and, you know, the very sound theological underpinning for stewardship. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that comes <coughs> up, a uh, practical matter about parishes and money is, um, what if we have a building campaign? Uh, what if we have a school and parents are paying tuition to mm -hmm. the schools? Can, can you say a few, few words about that? How does this work out with these various tithing percentages? For starters, I would say that almost every diocese in the country is, is talking about 5%, 4%, and 1%. And almost all have adopted that. That comes out of a f former bishop's pastoral in 1963, where they recommended that for the Catholic Church in the U.S. And uh, then what we have done through the, through the years now, like for example, right now in the Diocese of St. Augustine, we have a capital campaign to build high schools for about $30 million. And so how does that fit with stewardship? Well, <clears throat> it's very easy because in our case, we'll give... Five, keep, continue to give 5% to our parish, and we're going to give 2% of our, of our charity for the next four years to the capital campaign. So we just decided we'll move what we used to give somewhere else, we're just going to have to put it here. And then we'll give, still give 1% to the bishop's appeal. So any kind of, and then again, we also, where we give our talk, if you have children in Catholic school, they can take that out of the other 4% as well. And they may find that the 4% is more than it's more than 4% for the tuition. But, it, but they work that out. The important thing is to get Catholic parents with kids in school uh, to buy into this idea because when their kids are out of school, they will find that they can live that way and will continue to contribute to the church. 
we're all in different uh, conditions in our lives. Some people are retired, uh, the house is paid off, the children are raised, others are younger family. How do you address the issue of tithing to people in very different circumstances? Well, we don't try to make any differentiation because we leave that up to the people themselves. They'll decide if they're committed to this for the right reason, they'll figure out what's best for them. Because we, we you remember we mentioned tithe as a guide. For some people that may be impossible, and especially to dive into it like we did, uh, because it might be irresponsible even, might lose their house, uh, that kind of thing. So it, it's one of those things that gradually, we, we recommend the gradual approach, like if you're at 2% now, and the average for Catholics is about 2.5% for the country. So if, you, if you're giving 2% to the parish, you might kick it up to 3% next year. Then gradually move up to 10%. And what you'll find, most people who go into tithing will find is that they can do better than 10%. Mm -hmm. Because like where we live, we have a lot of Baptists, and they tithe 10%, and then they give another 5%, to charity, 10% is the minimum for them. So that, and they and they do a lot. They not nobody's missing a meal in that kind of thing. And we haven't missed a meal either. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the key really is uh, uh, to begin a conversation in your own family, mm -hmm. in your own right. prayerful way, about uh, the journey to stewardship. Right. And, and it's important, I think, to to begin with children, because they're open to the message. They're open more than the adults are. And so we have to start, that's one of the emphasis we're going to put into our diocese, is start more with children to get them on, on board. I, w I want to just go back to the family thing. I think it's important to sit down there with a yellow pad and a pencil and go through the checkbook from last year and just see how much did I give to my parish, how much did I give to other charity, where, w where is the tuition, you know, how did I help needy members of my family, and and see what we're giving. I think that people who are serious about their giving um, to charity, they're probably doing that really well, but where we, where we fall down is on our contribution to our parish. We're just about coming to the end of our conversation. I wonder if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with as a, a diocese which is just really beginning the journey to full stewardship. Well, I think that First of all, I think you have to you have to emphasize all three parts of stewardship: time, count, and treasure. All the research shows that people who are connected to their parish tend to be um, much more generous to their parish. So that's number one. And number two, a mission beyond the parish. That's very important. Uh, we are we were just at a meeting this week. People tend to want to give to people more than they want to give to institutions. And then, uh, thirdly, uh, hospitality is a, is a hallmark of a stewardship parish. People welcoming people at the doors of the church, uh, friendly, even in the parking lot. <laughs> Especially you know. in the parking lot. And, uh, and it means that the pastor has to be that kind of person, too. It, it, it starts with the leadership. And then I think that uh, annual renewals and then the lay witness and accountability is very important. People of today, because we're such a, we are so uh, concerned about money, are very, very cognizant and very aware of the fact that, that we like to know where their money is going. But going back to what I said earlier, I think that what stewardship requires a conversion, and that really only comes with a lot of different ways for young for people to meet in small groups. Like many of our parishes have small groups meet in the Lent and in Advent. They schedule them at twi just twice a year because they've learned that people will drop out. So doing it, doing it well is much better than doing it all year. So those are a couple of ideas. I think I would like to say to the diocese here of Charleston, just don't be afraid, you know, to step out in faith, to do this because this is the right thing to do, and, and God will just change the human heart, you know. We have to share the message, and, and, and God is going to change that heart, and, um, may, and we'll all become more generous. But we've got to start somewhere, and we've got to keep at it. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Dutch. Yeah. It's been a blessing and a pleasure to have you with us. You're welcome. Our pleasure. <laughs>